Go ahead, Dr. Kennedy, all you. Good morning, and welcome to our presidential debate. Our candidates, Jack Wilbur. We'll be discussing four categories today, the environment, immigration, health care, and the war on terror. Each candidate will have five minutes per issue, there will be five minutes per issue, a minute and a half each, and a two minute open discussion. Are the candidates ready? Yes. Yes. We'll flip a coin to see who will go first. Andrew, you win. All right. Andrew, many in the Conservative Party disagree with the scientific consensus on man-made climate change. Why? Information concerning a changing climate, especially projections into the long-range future, must be based on dispassionate analysis of hard data. We will enforce the standard throughout the executive branch among civil servants and presidential appointees alike. We reject the agenda of the Paris Agreement, which represents only the personal commitments of their signatories. To no agreement can be binding upon the United States until it is submitted to and ratified by the Senate. We firmly believe environmental problems are best solved by getting incentives for human ingenuity and the development of new technologies, not through top-down command and control regulations that stifle economic growth and cost thousands of jobs. Line party, Jack. What is the balance between governmental policies protecting the environment? and growing the economy. Well, really first, we must recognize that reconciling our mm, environment is absolutely sacrosanct. We have to recognize the perils that come with the paucity of preventative measures. The World Health Organization has stated an average increase of 0.6 degrees Celsius on the surface of the Earth since the 1800s, and this is expected to increase 1.4 degrees by the year 2100. The World Health Organization further estimates deaths as a result of extreme weather conditions. So, we have to recognize that recognizing these problems is of absolutely chief importance. Now, reconciling the economy, which is a task of particular difficulty. So, let me lay out some options of renewable energy. We have OTEP, which is a process by which energy is produced through the migration of ocean currents. We have geothermal energy. We have solar energy, hydropower, biothermal energy. I recognize that it is fully possible to maintain a system of renewable energy as soon as 2035. The installation of these renewable energy sources provides jobs for the displaced workers, especially the coal workers, because that's a particularly problematic situation in Kentucky. So, making a new market entirely for these jobs seems very pragmatic. Nice. This is a question for both of you. What reforms, be they economic, societal, political, etc., do you support for addressing environmental issues? So for us, our first reform is in agricultural production and exports, which is central to our party's agenda for jobs, growth, expanded trade, and even health to the environment. Modern farm practices and technologies, supported by programs in the Department of Agriculture, have led to reduce erosion, improved water and air quality, increased wildlife habitat, all the while maintaining improved agricultural yields. This stewardship of the land benefits everyone, and we remain committed to conservation policies based on the preservation, not the restriction, of working lands. For this reason, ranching on public lands must be fostered, developed, and encouraged. Under Mr. Wilburn's presidency, the world will certainly burn. Although I never stated any of the things my opponent has thought I've stated, here's the actual legitimate plans and policies I've been intimate, primarily concerning transportation. Let's look at a single car which emits about 4.6 metric tons of carbon dioxide each year. That's a single car. So now, what are some alternatives? We could look at short-term transportation, so biking, skating. Supporting these businesses supports a new facet of the economy, and if that's not pragmatic, I don't know what is. Um, we'll also look at public transit, which could be a very efficacious option. I propose introducing greater public transit options, maybe requiring some infrastructural changes, but that funding could come from our overfunded military. Very well. The award for the best word is efficacious. Now we'll move on to immigration. This is a question for both of you, and I am putting an adjective in here. How do you plan to handle the alleged mistreatment of immigrants in ICE camps? 
I think there's no legend about this. We've seen countless instances of Border Patrol officers sexually assaulting children and separating families. This is far too common. There are frequent accounts of ICE officers making legal misrepresentations too. Decreasing ICE's power, but increasing the power of capable consular workers seems most pragmatic in this case. I don't entirely agree with that because it's important that we give ICE its foundations its money because they are stifling the amount of illegal immigrants that are coming into our country, stealing jobs, and you even see murders, crimes, atrocious crimes indeed, just happening along our border. Um, in 2019, we pushed for a bill that passed $4.6 billion to ICE in order to relieve stress on detention camps and open up other options than physical detainment. We do not support abolishing ICE. It is a necessary government service, and it is important to keeping illegal immigrants out of our country. The fewer illegal immigrants, the more jobs for hardworking Americans, and the better the economy. I'd like to respond. Andrew says stifling illegal immigrants, but isn't that supported by your party? What do you mean by that? You said that ICE would be stifling illegal immigrants. Stopping the flow of illegal immigrants. But isn't that something your party supports? What do you mean? Like, supports like we support illegal immigrants? No, you support stopping the flow of illegal immigrants. And yes. you said that ICE would do that. Yeah, ICE is doing that. Stopping illegal immigrants. Problem resolved. <laughs>
a safe haven for those immigrants who do not find peace in their own country. And it does. It provides a safe haven for the people who do the process, who do the process of becoming a, a, a legal um, citizenship in America. They become a citizen. That's the whole process of it. That's what makes them a citizen, and if they enter illegally, then we, how can we protect them? How can we care for them if they're there illegally? This is a lethargic, slow, snail-paced process that is hardly doing the job it needs to do. And we are going to move on from immigration. I think you have made your point. And I really want to see the vice president candidates as well. So we're going to move on to health care. We'll start with the Gold Party. The coronavirus pandemic has exposed a weak public health infrastructure. How would your policy strengthen America's health care system? Wow, that's a good question. So, our America First healthcare plan increases choice, lowers costs for American families and seniors, provides better care, and protects people with pre existing conditions. The Gold Plan expands affordable insurance options, reduces the cost of prescription drugs, will end surprise medical billing, and it will increase fairness through price transparency. Streamline bureaucracy, accelerate innovation, strongly protect Medicare, and always protect patients with pre existing conditions. Very well. Pine Party. It is sometimes claimed that the U.S. is too big or diverse of a country to use government health care the way countries like Sweden or Russia do. And we know Russia is very good at poisoning political opponents, so they must have good health care. What is your response to them? Well, I'd like to divert your attention for a moment to the military. So, we recognize that they get $934 billion annually just to spend. They have $712.6 billion for discretionary spending, meaning that only $8.9 million of that is for mandatory expenses. The leftover money would find deep efficacy in supporting universal health care. We have these droves and droves of funding that are not going to the people's health. So, you claim that raising taxes would be problematic for predominantly the upper middle class, people who are not so poor that they'd be unaffected by the taxes, and not so rich that they'd be unaffected too. Um, we, there's no necessity of increasing their taxes as long as we take only 20% from the military's budget. Mm. Russia's like here and that. This is a question for both of you. Thousands of Americans die from lack of health care every year. Many more are left in crippling debt. How do you address this? Well, to start here, our party is committed to rebuilding and replacing Obamacare with a health care system that puts patients and their doctors in charge of their health care decisions. Government regulations have largely been responsible for the high costs associated with health care. We want to roll back regulations that have prevented market competition, allow patients to buy insurance, across state lines and shut the revolving doors of lawsuits that have driven up the price of drugs. While a safety net should exist for those Americans that desperately need it, a free market system is the best solution to providing the greatest possible care to the most amount of Americans. I'm very glad my opponent is an affirmation of a system that aids nobody but the rich. Um, my, we, we have this Affordable Care Act that is being rescinded by my opposition. This is a strong foundation. The only qualms that came with it were these heightened taxes for a very niche portion of our economy. As I've stated before, decreasing military funding and allocating it, just some reallocation, simple number crunching, is all we need to do to make this system one fitting for the entirety of the country. I'd like to butt in there. Um, you kind of accused me of saying that the, the rich should, should get higher health care. Um, no. So, for one thing, Americans in general, we need everyone to have a certain amount of health care. And if we want to impose a larger health care benefit for everyone in our nation, that would require to raise taxes, which you're pretty good at doing anyways. And in general, we need to just we need to be able to get people affordable health care for everyone in the sense that they don't need to buy large amounts. We need people who have the money to buy the large amounts so we can distribute that money to other people. What you're saying is, is higher taxes for everyone. If we were to have the same health plan budget for everyone in the entire world, that would cost the government thousands, billions, millions of dollars. And that's, we can't necessarily do that. We don't really have the exact funding. We have critical issues that we need to put our funding for. And 
Your plan just simply doesn't do it. Mr. Wilbur? Um, reading my notes here, I think I explicitly said that raising taxes would not be necessary. All I said is that the reallocation of funding from an organization that's already overfunded was the only thing I'd be doing. We're already using a foundation that's been put in place and has been proven effective. All I'm doing is giving it more money by taking money away from a place that does not need it any one bit. Uh, what exactly place is that? The military. The military? Yes. You want to take the money away from the military? They are so overfunded. How? Oh, give, give me what they're doing. Let me give you these numbers again, just a moment. So they have $934 billion for annual spending, and $712.6 billion of this is discretionary, meaning they can do whatever they want to do with it. Okay, again, if we're going to move on, one final question before we move on to the war on terror. A congressman from Georgia once spoke to a Rotary group being critical of him, being a Republican, for voting for the omnibus bill. And he said he only let lobbyists in and opponents in and they could explain what their opponent has against them. What is good for you, good for you? How would you address what you agree with, Mr. Wilburn? And how would you address what you agree with? I think that Andrew has very wise economic plans. I think his ideas of maintaining economic regulation are very pragmatic, although in some cases, ununiversal. But that's all right, because maintaining a system is important, and Andrew does that well. So for me, I think I would agree with Jack here on uh, military spending. We do have a large bill on that, but I, it's, it's in comparison to the bill that we have for our environment. And facts and data show that we don't necessarily need to put that much money into our environment. So at the same time, I believe that like military, yes, it does have a large amount of money, but sometimes they need it. Uh, things like the environment, we don't necessarily need to increase our taxes to be able to afford and put spending towards that. Um, so I do agree with Jack in that sense, but also there's some things I disagree with. But that's okay, because this is politics. Very good. You each have 30 seconds to close out. Andrew, since you began, Jack? You have 30 seconds to make your case to the American people and this incredible classroom. I have only one thing to say. Jack will burn bright, so vote for who's right. Andrew. <laughs> and I have another thing to say here. You've seen from this debate, you've seen the size. Now it's up to you voters. You must vote. The power is in your hands. You see throughout the entire thing, the entire election, but the power is truly in your hands, and I would like you to take that into consideration. And don't vote for Jack. He won't have your back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Candace.